In my opinion, using any CRT is one of the best ways to experience classic games, but their quality can vary greatly. RGB monitors are some of the sharpest CRTs, but they can be expensive and hard to find. VGA monitors can be really high quality as well, and unlike RGB monitors, you can still find them dirt cheap, but they're not directly compatible with retro gaming signals, unless you use the right converter. This video is going to compare a few different options for playing retro games on a VGA monitor and compare them to how they look on an RGB monitor. There's many ways to play classic games on a VGA CRT monitor, but for this video I'm going to focus on methods that use original hardware through devices that were designed by and for the retro gaming community. Also a lot of the comparison shots I'm going to show are the same thing over and over, just so that you could see how everything compares to each other. I realize that could be a bit boring though, so make sure to stay to the end because I'm going to throw in as much extra footage as I can just to make it a little bit more interesting. So okay, let's get started. For these tests, I'll be using a Sony PVM-20L5 as it accepts both 240p and 480p signals. That means we could use the exact same tube and camera settings to test all signals. I'll also be using the same HDMI to VGA DAC on all these tests through a passive sync combiner, which you can see adds zero lag to the signal. To start, here's the original 240p RGB signal going directly into the monitor. This PVM has a really high line count, so you should be able to note the definition of the horizontal scan lines as well as the vertical mask of the monitor. Now let's use the open source scan converter to scale the image to 480p. It still looks great, but different as the 31 kHz image changes the way the scan lines look. The goal is to retain the original look of the game, so check this out. Let's turn on artificial scan lines and set them to 100%. Now that looks much more accurate. The only major difference is brightness, as adding scan lines dims it a bit. Simply turning up the brightness on your monitor will fix this though, and the rest of the comparisons in this video will have the brightness match on each, just to be a fair comparison. This is by far my favorite use of artificial scan lines, as the CRT still retains the vertical mask, creating a really accurate 240p look. Alternatively, adding horizontal lines on flat panels without any vertical lines to match always felt a bit fake to me, as it was lacking the vertical detail. Also, the OSSC could be tweaked even further. I was just showing generic mode, but if we load optimal profiles and set it to 480p, we can dial in an even sharper signal. The process will be mostly the same as using the OSSC with a flat panel, with the aspect ratio being the only difference. As you can see, I had to change the aspect to generic 4x3 for it to fit properly. As a note, I didn't want to mess with my PVM settings, so the aspect ratio of some of these other comparisons will be slightly off. For your setup, just make sure to tweak the horizontal stretching to fill the whole screen, and it'll match the original signal perfectly. Okay, now let's take a look at the RetroTINK products. Here's the 2x SCART with scan lines turned on. It's not quite as sharp as the OSSC with optimal timings, but seems about on par with the OSSC in generic 480p mode. Generic versus optimal timings aren't nearly as noticeable as when using a flat panel though, so the RetroTINK really works well in this scenario. Next, here's the GBS scaler with GBS control installed. I recently reviewed this scaler, and while I wasn't impressed with it in its original form, after flashing the custom GBS control firmware, it's really good. Also, as long as you could mod it yourself, using GBS control on a GBS 8200 module would be the cheapest solution. Please note that the only version of the GBS I had available while shooting this video was the lower quality one without the fix. GBS control will actually look slightly better than this on your monitor. More on all that in another video though. So overall, I think that was a pretty good example of how these different signals look when compared on the same tube. I think all of the line doublers did a great job mimicking the pretty much exact signal as the original, and I think people could feel confident using them on a VGA monitor knowing that they're getting an authentic experience. 
I did want to show footage of an actual VGA monitor, and I really tried to hunt down a Sony 20 inch so that we'd be comparing the same size and the same type of tube. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find one of those, but I was able to pick up a brand new 17 inch IBM monitor that was still boxed up. Now, the tube in these is totally different from the one in the 20L5, but I think that's a good thing, as we'll be able to see a different style of tube. I honestly like them both, and the point is, both will have an authentic 240p look when we use the scalers mentioned before. As a note, any VGA monitor in decent condition should look the same as what I'm about to show, but I thought it would be fun to unbox a new one in this video. Oh, and just to be silly, let's lag test the VGA monitor. I think we all knew it would show zero milliseconds, but aren't those zeros satisfying to see? So here's the same shot of the OSSC with the camera positioned as similarly as possible to the original tests. Once again, the biggest difference you're seeing is the Sony tube versus the IBM tube, as well as the 17 inch versus 20 inch size difference. The overall look is exactly what 240p should look like. One thing to note is every VGA monitor I tried will require you to adjust the horizontal and vertical size to match the image. In some cases, this is because the scalers are outputting a widescreen signal, so you might not be able to get it all the way to the sides, but you should be able to come really close. There's a few more cool things to try. First, here's the RetroTINK 2X Pro scaling composite video. It's obviously not as good as higher quality signals, but you're still playing with zero lag on a CRT. If composite is your main focus, I'd just recommend getting a basic consumer TV, but at least this is an option. Now, here's the N64 with scan lines turned on. I think it looks just as accurate as the other examples, but check this out. Here's the RetroTINK's smoothing filter turned on. I really love what this filter does to the N64's graphics, and I think it's a great fit on a CRT. I only wish you could have both the filter and scan lines at the same time. Another cool feature of using a scaler like this is 480i deinterlacing. I often recommend people play 480i games on a basic consumer CRT, as interlaced video looks fine on any tube, but these games also look pretty good deinterlaced to 480p on a VGA monitor. I'm not sure if that's a big use case, but since VGA monitors aren't compatible with 480i signals directly, I guess there's plenty of scenarios that this would be a help. Also, here's a really unique option called the RetroScaler A1, which is a device that automatically scans the input signal and uses its built-in detection to get the equivalent of OSSC optimal timings. It requires a bit of setup, which just involves creating an INI file and placing it on a micro SD card. For this test, I'm just setting it to accept standard RGB SCART signals, but it could be configured to accept pretty much anything, including direct JAMA video from arcade boards. So I guess setup is really only that one SD card setting, as long as you're not switching back and forth between arcade boards and consoles. Retro fans are probably wondering why I haven't mentioned this device before, as auto detection is a pretty game changing feature, but the downside is compatibility. See, this isn't compatible with HDMI converters or with capture cards, and it wouldn't even work with my 20L5, and that's why I didn't show it before in the other comparisons. That means the only scenario you'd be able to use the RetroScaler A1 is with the 480p CRT. Also, it's expensive at over $200. It is probably the best choice for someone with a 31 kilohertz arcade machine who wants an easy way to get 15 kilohertz boards working on it. I also think it's an excellent option for VGA monitors, but it's hard to justify the extra cost for a single use device. I wanted to test some features that would normally only be available in 240p, and the first I had to try is Sega 3D games, and they work. I actually think using these with the blurry blending of composite video on a consumer CRT looks a bit better in 3D, but they'll definitely work on a VGA monitor with and without scan lines something you can't do on a flat panel. Unfortunately, light guns mostly don't work. Master System and Saturn games don't register at all, and it's my guess that most consoles won't work as they're looking for a 15 kHz signal. Interestingly enough, NES light gun games do work, even with scan lines turned on. 
I think that's because nest games are just looking for the white square, and this is the same reason you could use some zappers on a zero lag flat panel, or with a software mod that delays the signal to match the TV's lag. To be honest though, if your goal is light gun games, it's much easier to just get any cheap consumer grade CRT and use composite video. It might not be as sharp as this, but it'll be compatible with everything. One last thing to mention with CRTs is there's barely any delay when switching between 240p and 480i, as the CRT just sees both as 15 kHz. Some games have menus that are 480i and gameplay that's 240p, so combining these games with the RetroTINK products that are known for fast switching is a great way to solve that issue. One last thing I wanted to mention is almost all of these devices have multiple uses. So while yes, using them through a converter on a VGA monitor is pretty awesome, devices like the RetroTINKs and the OSSC, and even the RAD 2X, which could be used the same way I showed here, all are great experiences on flat panel screens as well. The RetroScaler A1 is good for both VGA monitors and 31 kHz arcade monitors, and of course the GBS control could be used with pretty much everything, you just might need more converters, such as a VGA to HDMI converter to use it on a flat panel. Another good thing for setups like this, with the exception of the RetroScaler A1, is streaming. You could have the same setup, just put an HDMI splitter in the chain, and send the second output to pretty much any capture card, and have yourselves a great stream while having zero lag on a CRT monitor for your actual gaming. Now, you could even do higher resolution streams by scaling the video capture in OBS or whatever your software is, so if you still wanted a nice crispy 1080p stream, just double that 480p signal, and then add your cameras and your overlays, and you're all set. So overall, I think this is a solution that anybody who wants a CRT but can't find an RGB monitor might want to consider. Well, that's it for this time. If you liked what you saw here, please consider signing up for any of the support services such as Floatplane and Patreon, because without your support, videos like this, as well as all of the behind the scenes research that goes into them, would never be able to happen. Also, if you'd like to be kept in the loop of everything going on in the retro gaming scene, Check out the weekly podcast available every Wednesday as a video and everywhere audio podcasts are found. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.